Do you believe this is the Word of God? Do you believe it's true? Do you believe it's historically accurate, reliable? Why? Good question. Join Dr. Bo Kirkwood as he reviews the evidences from McDowell's book and anchors our faith in God's book. Now, Dr. Bo Kirkwood. So today we're going to be looking at the deity of Christ. In specific, we're going to be looking at whether or not Jesus considered himself the Son of God and whether those around him considered himself the Son of God. You say, well, isn't that obvious? Well, it, it, it may not be as obvious as you think. The question of what Jesus thought about himself is a critical issue. This is according to Lee Strobel from The Case for Christ. Some professors, quote unquote, professors of theology or whatever, professors of religion, maintain uh, that the myth of Jesus' deity was superimposed on Jesus, the Jesus tradition by overzealous supporters years after his death. In other words, Christ didn't consider himself the Son of God, if, if he was even real. He didn't consider himself the Son of God. It, that didn't occur until all, long after his death when his followers deified him. Uh, and now that, that sounds preposterous to, to us because we, most of us grew up in the church. We don't, we don't buy into that, but that was a popular thing. And it, it, it became a little bit more popular back about 1977 when a British uh, theo theologian, John Hick, and about a half a dozen like-minded colleagues, uh, they prompted this firestorm of controversy by charging that Jesus never thought of himself as God uh, incarnate or the Messiah. And these concepts they wrote developed later and were written into the gospel so as it appeared that Jesus was making them same, these, these claims about himself. So those claims in the gospel where Jesus clearly says he's the son of God and that he is God on earth, uh, that's not what Jesus really said. These were, they were, these were superimposed after his death by his followers to deify him. Now there's no evidence to that whatsoever, okay? That is just somebody's presuppositions. There's just no evidence to that at, at all. But you see that now in, in, in the modern circles of some uh, theologic seminaries even. So we're going to look at that today because as Josh McDowell says, well actually Linton from Josh McDowell, obviously who, Christian, who Christ is is as important as what he did. You know, it's fine if he was a good man, but that's, he claimed to be just a whole lot more than that, didn't he? He claimed to be a lot more than just a good man or a good prophet. He claimed to be the Son of God. Christ, and this is important I think, because of all the religious quote unquote leaders, and of all the religions in the world, Christ is very unique because they didn't consider themselves God. People like Muhammad, Buddha, Moses, Confucius, etc., 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 those large religious leaders, I can say relig leaders of large religions, did not consider themselves the Son of God. Prophets, maybe, but not uh, Muhammad especially, but, but not sons of God. Now, there's people. There's kooky people that have claimed to be the Son of God, but they don't generate any followers. There's a reason they don't generate any followers, isn't there? Because we understand that they're, you know, they're, they've got a problem psychologically, so they, they fall by the wayside. But the major religious leaders that we know of never really considered themselves the Son of God. But Christ did. Jesus did. And that makes Him quite unique in the religious world. Christ is the only religious leader who has ever claimed to be deity, and the only individual who has ever convinced a portion, and I would say a great portion of the world, that he is God. Probably half the world population believe in Christ. And so that's a pretty big portion. And he's the only one of those that considers himself, or, and others as well, considered himself to be the Son of God. In Matthew 6, 15 through 17, Jesus asked Peter, What do you say that I am? That's in response to you know, what do other people say that I am? And then Peter, you know, Christ wanted to know, what do you think about me, Peter? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Christ did not shun from what Peter claimed he was. He didn't say, oh, well, you got that a little wrong, Peter. That's not, a, that, that's not exactly right. No, he was exactly right. We look at the trial of Jesus in Mark 14, 61 through 64. Jesus makes clear his claim. 
But he kept silent and made no answer again. The high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Clear question that he's being given. Very clear what, what the priest is asking him, the high priest here. And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of God sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the, uh, with the clouds of heaven. Then tearing his clothes, the high priest said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. What were they condemning him to death for? Bla what they considered blasphemy because he claimed to be the Son of God. So if Jesus didn't consider himself the Son of God, why did he die? I mean, it's kind of ri ridiculous, some of these claims, but we have to address them because it's out there. It's out there even in our brethren in one form or the other that Jesus himself wasn't actually deity, which is not true, and didn't, sorry, that he didn't claim to be. Jesus clearly, or claimed deity clearly for himself, in a way that all his accusers could understand. They, there was no mistake. Jesus answered him, we have a law, and, uh, uh, excuse me, this is after Jesus answered him, says, we have a law, and by that law he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Here again, at his trial. So let's look, let's look at Jesus' own words from the Gospels and see what he claimed himself to be. Did he actually absolutely 100% consider himself the Son of God? Did he claim to be from heaven? Did he claim to be on an equal uh, par, equal standing with God himself? And we just look at look what the Bible says. Now, I guess you could argue these were inserted later on, but there's absolutely no evidence of that. There's no documents where there was something written beforehand that where Jesus didn't say he was the Son of God. All the documents we have claim that he was, and in his own words. And I think when you add these all together, it doesn't make sense that somebody did this after his death. Once again, why would he have died if he didn't claim to be the Son of God? That's what he was persecuted for. That's why he was, that's what he was uh, put on the cross for. So what did Jesus say in John 5, 25 through 33? In, in, some of this we, we've, uh, we've condensed a little bit for sake of time. And Jesus answered, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself of God. And Jesus didn't refute that. So they understood what he was claiming. The Jews understood clearly what Jesus' claim was. They didn't believe it, most of them, of course. Of course, quite a few did, and they became Christians. But they understood clearly what he was, say what he was saying about himself. There was no question about it. This is from Bible commentator J. Carl Laney from, from your book. He notes that the word one is the Greek word hen, and it's neuter, and it speaks of one essence not one person. The Father and the Son share a oneness of divine essence, yet remain two distinct persons within the Godhead. They both are equal, but they both are God. They are a one essence. And that's hard for us to get our minds around to understand that. It's always been hard for me to understand how there could be God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and yet there still be one God. But there is one essence of God with three personalities. We understand, and it's a difficult thing to comprehend, but that's what the Bible says. John 5, 17, 18. But Jesus answered them, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. So when he says, My Father, he's equating himself to God. This is what biblical scholar Merrill C. Tenney explains. The Jews were angry because of Jesus' violation of the Sabbath. What did he do on the Sabbath? Do you remember? Yeah, he healed, he healed someone. And then I don't think that was a breaking of the Sabbath, by the way. That's what the Jews' claim was. He didn't break any law of the Sabbath, but that's what their claim was. But they were, they were, they were, they were angry about that, but they were furious about his presumptu presumptuousness that he claimed to be equal to, to the Father. They were furious about that. There was no mistake what they, what they thought. 
8, uh, John 8, 5, uh, 58, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Where has the, the, the word I am shown up before in our Bibles? Right, when God spoke to Moses, what did God call himself then? That's right, I am who I am. Jesus is saying basically the same thing here. He says, before Abraham was, I am. I am refers to the name of God himself. And we use the word Yahweh, uh, that's the Hebrew word for God. And actually the word was written without any uh, uh, vowels. A.J. Campbell makes this inference for us from such Old Testament references as Exodus 3, 14, like we just talked about, Deuteronomy 32, 39, and Isaiah 43 and 10. It's clear that this, that this is no new idea which Jesus is presenting. The Jews would have understood that expression when he said, I am. This was not new to them. They've heard this before, and they knew what that meant. He was equating himself with God the Father. Campbell, Campbell explains, that we must also understand the expression I am, which is emi, E-I-M-I, -I, as intended to declare the full deity of Christ is clear from the fact that Jesus did not attempt an explanation. He didn't explain what that meant. He didn't need to explain what they meant to the Jews. They knew what it meant, so it didn't need an explanation. He did not try to convince the Jews that they had misunderstood him but rather he repeated the statement several times on various occasions. So when Jesus said, I am, he's clearly equating himself to God. So Jesus is due the same honor as that of God. And he says so in John 5, 23 and 24, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. So when you honor Jesus on earth, those who honored him, and if you honor him now, you're honoring God. And that's what Jesus said. So if you believe the words of Jesus, you believe the words of God, believe the words of God, you believe the words of Jesus, they're the same essence. Same part of the Godhead. In John 18, 19, they said to him, Where is your father? And he answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. They're one. He equates himself to God. So this idea that Jesus never claimed to, to be God is just repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly refuted if you read your Bible. You don't have to believe the Bible, but you, if you read the Bible, there's no doubt about it. Jesus says in John 14, 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now next week we're going to see whether or not Jesus was a lunatic or a liar. But there's no question about what he claimed to be. But could he have been crazy? Could he have been lying about it all? We're going to look at that in detail. Uh, Jerry sort of stole my thunder a little, about, a little bit with that last sermon. He kind of borrowed this chapter but that we're going to look at next week. But nonetheless, we're going to look at that in detail. But no doubt about what he claimed. You just have to decide, lunatic, liar, or the Lord. In John 14, 8 and 9, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Philip apparently didn't have a full understanding yet. So he asked Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? You, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? You want to see God? Here He is. That's what Jesus is saying. God incarnate. In Matthew 5, Jesus repeatedly uses the word, but I say to you. Now, what does this mean when He repeatedly says, but I say to you? And you all remember Matthew chapter 5's Sermon on the Mount and, and, and the other references that Christ uses that term, but I say to you. This shows he never apologized or hesitated, withdrew, or modified anything he said. He spoke like God, unequivocal. He spoke like the unequivocal words of God. But I say to you, he had a different authority than he, any other man that had ever walked the earth. When Moses spoke, Moses was speaking for who? God. 
when Isaiah or Jeremiah or any prophet before Christ, John the Baptist, when he spoke, on whose authority was he speaking by? Not their own. But when Jesus spoke, he was speaking from his own authority and as God, unequivocal words of God. And he could say that and he could use that authoritatively. Now here's the other thing. Jesus was worshiped as well. Now we're not going to turn to these verses. We're going to, we're going to look at a few more in just a second. But that seems several times throughout your, your New Testament. Did any man deserve worship? Never. Never, never, never was any man deserving of worship. And those that tried to be worshiped and they knew better turned it down. But we see in Matthew 8, 22, and behold, a leopard came and worshiped him. John 9, 35 through 39, the man, we're not going to turn and read all those verses, but you remember the, the story about the, the, the young man that was born blind and was healed. And after he's healed, he falls down and worships Christ. Did Christ refuse worship? He did not. His disciples worshiped him. Matthew 14, 33, the disciples worshiped him saying, of truth thou art the Son of God. They, and Jesus didn't, re, didn't deny that and refute it. Uh, Thomas's proclamation in John 20, 27 through 29, my Lord and my God demonstrates how the apostles felt about Jesus. And he never refused to be worshiped or be called the Son of God. So if all this was put in afterwards by people that wanted to deify Christ, that's a I just uh, have to make up a whole new story to, in order to do that. So contrasted with other biblical characters, Jesus alone allowed worship. Acts 10, 25, 26. Cornelius fell at the feet of Peter, Peter and worshiped him. What did Peter say? Stand up. I myself also am a man. He didn't, Peter would not allow that. Revelation 19, 10. John fell at the feet of an angel. But what did the angel tell him? He's a fellow servant. And, and John was to worship God. So Jesus alone allowed to be worshiped. And again, if somebody allows himself to be worshiped, they're, blas they're guilty of blasphemy. But Jesus, his followers, his apostles, uh, did, not, uh, did not allow themselves to be worshiped, even though many times people wanted to do that. It would be kind of natural, wouldn't it? If you saw someone healing someone, raising someone from the dead, it would be natural to maybe think that they're God. Now, Jesus did those miracles, but you know, his apostles did too. Not only did his apostles do the uh, miracles, but who else could do miracles? People that had their hands laid upon by the apostles, but those people could not transmit that power. The apostles only had the power to transmit the power of the Holy Spirit uh, in order to do miracles. And that, that, that died with that next generation. But they were not God. They didn't allow themselves to be worshipped as God. But it would be kind of natural to see why people might want to do that. <clears throat> it would be natural to see John falling down, wouldn't it, in front of this angel. But told him, no, I'm a fellow servant. So what did other New Testament writers say about Christ? So Christ said he was God. What did the other New Testament writers? We're going to look at several. And we're going to start by looking at Paul. <clears throat> Paul on many occasions. Uh, uh, verified or validified the idea that Jesus was, was the Son of God in Romans 9, 5, of whom the Jewish people are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. This is a little bit lengthy, but in Phil, uh, the Philippian letter 2, 6 through 11, speaking about the nature of Christ, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of of God the Father. The word Lord equates to God here. Okay. Now you say, well, how can God, Jesus be God and be a man too? That's another thing that's difficult for us to grasp. Did he give up his deity to become man? No, he didn't. But he certainly wasn't in heaven anymore. And there was, there was things that, that when he take, took on the form of man changed in his essence. But he was still God. But he suffered pain, just like a human being would. 
He suffered hang, hunger. He suffered all those things, yet he did it without sin, but he was God. Colossians 1, 5, 15 through 17. Again, this is from Paul. Speaking of Christ, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in earth and that are on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones are dominions, are principalities, are powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So when you read your book of Genesis, according to Colossians, who's the creator of the world? Christ. Is he God? Well, Genesis says it's God. They're one. It's the same essence. But that's, you know, when I was young, I didn't quite understand that. But when you read about the creation, it's Christ creating the earth. It's what Colossians says, if you believe Colossians. Also in Colossians, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Took on the form of man, but in him he's God in the, in the flesh. Titus 2, 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Is there any doubt at all who Paul thought Christ was? No. How about John the Baptist? Speaking of John and John the Baptist, we spoke of earlier, who did John the Baptist think, or what did he think about Christ? Well, we know when the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus at his baptism by John, he descended as a dove, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is God speaking, God the Father speaking, with the Holy Spirit descending uh, on Christ as, as a dove. We all have all three of the Godhead at one time at that event. But John was considered a great man during his time before Christ. He was out baptizing. He was baptizing for repentance. But John didn't consider himself to be God, did he? And when he saw Christ, he understood who Christ was. He was the forebearer. He was the forerunner. John 1, 29 and 34. John the Baptist proclaims, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Certainly John the Baptist knew who Jesus was. And when he baptized him, he knew who he was baptizing. He was baptizing the Son of God, who in essence was God himself. How about Peter? Peter the Apostle. Peter says in Peter 16, 15 through 17, But who do you say I am? We've read this already. But you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what Peter's proclamation was. But also in Acts 2, 36, at the great sermon on the day of Pentecost, Peter told those Jews there, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And again, Lord meaning God. And then in his epistle, in 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Peter says once again, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. How about the Hebrew writer? We don't know for sure who the Hebrew writer was. There's a debate on who that was. So McDowell in his book doesn't try to figure out who that is, but I personally think it's probably like Paul. But still, whether it was or not, the Hebrew writer in several instances proclaims that Jesus was God. Talking about Jesus, who being the brightness of His glory and the expressed image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, indicating the power of God. And then Hebrews 1.8, But to the Son He says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Talking about Jesus Christ, talking about His kingdom and His throne, and again, the Word God. Using the Word God. And then, finally, John the Apostle. John 1.1, 1, 1, in verse 14 also. We can convince, condense those and left out all the other verses because they weren't pertinent to what we were talking about. But in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So when I say Jesus was there at the creation, I believe this beginning event is what we're talking about here. In the beginning. The beginning of what? Not the beginning of God. God has no beginning. So it's the beginning of the creation, the creation event. Jesus Christ was there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and 
uh, was with God and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh, Jesus Christ, and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then the Epistle John, John 5.20, I think the same writer, the Apostle John. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And then John 20, verse 30, and many other signs, and this is back to the Gospel of John, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye may have life through him. Is there any doubt who Jesus thought he was or what his apostles thought he was, who he, who he was? No doubt at all. So it's nonsense to think otherwise. And it's just, I don't know, trying to sell books. I don't know why we, but people want to try to take take God out of Jesus Christ, but you can't. But there are indirect claims as well. He claimed that, but let's look at some indirect ways that also show that he was the Son of God and, and that he claimed to be the Son of God. One, is the thing, one was he forgave sins. Who can forgive sins? Can a human being forgive sins? Can you or I forgive someone's sins? Could anybody forgive somebody's sins? Only God can do that. And the Jews understood that. So when he forgave sins, they knew what he was saying. So in Mark 2, 5 through 7, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? They understood that. They understood that claim. So when Jesus said, I'm forgiving sins, or your sins are forgiven you, he's equating himself to God, right? No doubt. Josh McDowell says forgiveness is a prerogative of God alone. Amen. That's right. Only God can do that. And Jesus was God. So Jesus claimed also to be life. John 14, 16. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What does that mean? He's the way to eternal life, correct? And Jesus made that claim. John, uh, 1 John 5 11 and 12, in Christ is life. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. And he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Who has the power to grant eternal life? Only God. And Jesus was God. So this is another, I guess you could say, uh, implication to his godhood. You say, well, he says he can forgive sins. He says he can uh, grant eternal life. We have no proof of that, but that's what his, what his claim was. And if he can do those things, he clearly was God and not just a man. Look at his authority. He spoke as, a, as the authority of God. We, this, we alluded to this a little bit earlier. But in John 5, 27, he, God, gave him, Jesus, authority to exercise judgment because he, Jesus, those are in parentheses, so you just know what we're talking about in this context, is the Son of God. God gave Jesus authority to exercise judgment because he was the Son of God. And this was from John Scott in your book, Josh McDowell's The New Evidence. And that this is not only will Jesus be the judge, but the criteria of judgment will be men's attitude to him as shown in their treatment of his brethren or in the response to his word. And it is hard to exaggerate the magnitude of this claim. And again, I'd say amen to that as well. So not only is God, not only is Jesus going to be the judge, but what's the criteria for the judgment? What you believe about him. Right? So he's judging that. And how would you manifest that? Your treatment towards your brethren. Remember the statement you say, if you do this to the least of them, you've done it unto me. So that was one way it would be shown. And again, it would be hard to exaggerate the magnitude of that claim. Yeah, that is it. That's the essence of our life as a Christian. And then you look at titles. What was he called? We've already, again, alluded to this as well. The word Lord. Jesus is frequently referred to as Lord. 
The original Hebrew word for Lord was four consonants, as we also talked about, and that's, we pronounce it Yahweh, but it was really H-Y-W-H, and the Jews weren't even supposed to pronounce that. So they had to come up with another name, because so, they weren't supposed to try to pronounce that name when, that, when, they, were, when they were talking about the Lord or God. So the Jews regarded this name as sacred. And as the name was treated with ever more and more reverence, the Jews ceased to pronounce it during the latter part of the Old Testament period. So in Matthew 13, 14, and 15, Christ identifies himself as Lord. And Lord in this verse is really not Yahweh, but it's the word that the Jews used to substitute, substitute for that. And they, but they understood it. The Jews substituted Elohim for uh, Yahweh. Uh, and Jesus referred to himself also as the Son of Man. How many times in your New Testament, I mean, I don't want you to try to give me a number, but how many times do you think Jesus Christ used the term Son of Man? He used it over and over again. And it was unique to himself. He didn't say that about anybody else. When, so when you hear the word Son of Man in your New Testament, it's not talking about Son of Men like us. There's a uniqueness to this. And so he used this in three ways concerning his ministry, when he was foretelling his passion or his crucifixion and in his teaching regarding his coming again. And that son of man is a distinctive term for himself referring to the fact of his deity. So the son of man is distinctive because it is a designation which Jesus habitually used concerning himself. And it is not found in the New Testament on any other lips than his own except when his questioners quoted his own words saying you claim to be the Son of Man, and in the instance of Jesus, uh, excuse me, of Stephen's ecstatic exclamation at his, at his uh, death, at the moment of his martyrdom, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Who do you think G uh, Stephen was referring to in that verse? Obviously Christ. Son of Man is clearly a messianic title that the Jews recognize. And then in, in Mark 15, uh, 14, 36, Jesus prays to God using the word Abba, Father. Michael Green from McDowell's book points out that the word Abba is a familiar word of closest intimacy. He states that nobody before Jesus in all the history of Israel had addressed God by those words, which, by the way, they're Aramaic, uh, Abba is. Joshua McDowell points out that even David did not use a term like this, but referred to God as like a father. This was a very specific term, and it was a term used only by Jesus. And uh, something happened. Uh, the, okay, this is it. We'll finish a few minutes early, but the word Abba, once again, um, it's a very affectionate term that Jesus was allowed to use when addressing his father. And so... You don't see that term anywhere else. And all these terms then show uh, that Jesus considered himself on an equal of God and considers himself the son of God. And I, I think uh, there's just absolutely no doubt that Jesus considered himself the son of God and his apostles considered himself the son of God. And uh, again, to put that stuff that uh, he was not considered that by his followers till after his death in order to deify him. I would ask this question, what was the purpose of that anyway? Why would they have wanted to do that? Because many of them... Were, were martyred as a result of that. M many Christians died believing that he was the Son of God. So what would have been their motivation for doing that? Any questions or comments? We're a few minutes early. In all of the uh, responses, especially during while Christ was living, the traps they would put out and the things that they would try and catch him, it wasn't though he was just a smart individual who had learned the law and learned the basics. He knew what they were trying to do and answer in such ways that they couldn't trap him. Right. He showed that he knew more than just the law. He didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't skirt from it. You know, sometimes I think, you know, with Jesus at his persecution, it seemed like he could have said more. I, I mean, as, I'm talking as a human being, uh, as, as uh, trying, trying to figure out why he didn't speak up even more. Why did he not perform miracles in front of the, the high priest there, you know, say, I'm the son of God and, and do something like Moses did, you know, turn, turn water into blood or, you know, whatever. He didn't do that. He had already done all those miracles before, but he was fulfilling scripture. I know that. He was fulfilling prophecy when he kept silent. He didn't, he didn't keep silent, though, in, in, this, in, in, in the sense that he was denying their accusation. 
if they were accusing him of proclaiming to be the Son of God, he was guilty. He did that because he was. But sometimes you, you ask, why did he not, you know, be a little bit more vocal? And I, 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 the, my answer to that is that he was fulfilling Scripture, but also I don't know if it would have done any good anyway. Because they were already set in their mind. Miracles had been done. And they had, they had witnessed those miracles. Even the people that put him to death had witnessed those miracles. And they were, I guess they were denying they were from God. They were saying they were from Belzebub or, or Satan. But they were denying that he was the Son of God. Because they didn't understand Old, script, uh, Old Testament Scripture. They didn't understand in what way the Messiah was going to come. They were looking for that earthly Messiah, that leader, that someone like Joshua or someone like that. And Jesus wasn't that man. Yes, David. Well, you said what I was going to say, like in Matthew 12, when he, when he healed that person, and then they said he did it by the power of Beelzebub, which was clearly illogical, which he pointed out. You can do something like that in front of people, but if they don't want to believe something, they will not. And something else about the, about the forgiving of sins and worship, the Catholics are guilty of both of those things. The priest, the Pope receives worship, and the priest tries to say that you're forgiven of your sins. So they, they do two blasphemous things right off the top of my head, I think that. Yeah, I agree. Any other comments? So next week, again, look at that chapter. It's a fairly short chapter, actually. Uh, but look at the chapter again. Uh, Jerry preached a sermon on it, but it'd be good to refresh yeah. what he said. And there's a few other things that here that he didn't bring out. But Jesus is either lunatic, liar, or he's the Lord. There's a couple other things though that he could still be, and we've looked at that already in this class. He could say that he was mythical, but we've kind of shot that down, haven't we? Or he could say what we've talked about today. He didn't consider himself Christ, but others did after him. We shot that stuff down today as well. So next week it'll be lunatic liar Lord. Thank you.